Okay, um, well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome Mohamed Zagu who, and thank him for visiting us, albeit virtually, this morning. Uh, we, we actually met for the first time a few years back at the High Pressure Gordon Conference, and I've been sort of following his work with great interest ever since. Um, and so he did his PhD at Harvard working with Isaac Silvera, after which he, uh, a few years ago, started a position as a faculty scientist at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics, which some of you may know better as the home of the Omega Laser Facility at the University of Rochester. Um, and so in recent years, he's um, looked at several high energy density physics and materials problems with the goal of better understanding uh, the building blocks of planetary interiors, both using um, ultra high pressure experiments, as well as thermodynamic modeling, some of which I believe he's going to be telling us about um, this morning. So without further ado, I'll um, turn it over to him. Um, and uh, so go, go ahead. <laughs> That was probably the best summary for, uh, for, for the intro for the talk. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, thanks, Mike, as well, for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be joining you guys at the, at the Carnegie. I was just learning that the merge happened this year, and I learned that I happened to be one of the second speakers. Kind of exciting. Um, I've always admired how the, the Carnegie have been one of the last strongholds for high pressures and for planetary science. And, for somehow it has pioneered a model for how to integrate this research that a lot of universities can, can learn from. And we, as part of a national lab, not exactly a national lab, we try to emulate this model in a way we integrate planetary science, maybe some space observation and, and high pressure physics, which is a, a core capability that we have. Uh, so I work at the laboratory for laser energetics. This is at the University of Rochester. And for you guys who are not familiar with it, I'm gonna give a very brief intro. Uh, from a slide that I stole from a director. Um, the title for this talk is um, what are we learning or what can we learn from some thermodynamic and vernal physics constraints on how we understand the magnetic and thermal states of exoplanets. And uh, if you guys are sh seeing the, the video that I have in the interest slide, it's probably an exoplanet that is interacting, it's magnetosphere, it's lack of magnetosphere is interacting with, um, with a, a, a stellar object near it and it's losing its atmosphere, probably maybe because it doesn't have a magnetic field. Um, so if I can do, let me first thank the collaborators that I have, it's a very large network. When I was doing a PhD, my PhD, it was a very small list. Uh, now that we have matured into our large collaborations, that, so start with the obvious of our colleagues at LE and the University of Rochester, some of the students that I have the privilege of monitoring, Heather, and Greg, Linda, and Maggie, and I'm going to be showing some of their work. Um, our fellow faculty scientists uh, at the lab, Ryan, Rip, and then a great uh, Alpine issue team, Sushin and Valentin, and then other scientists who recently joined us, Danae and Michelle. And also we have collaborators on campus, Ranga Diaz, Eric Blackman, and Hussein. Um, we have a strong collaboration with, with Livermore uh, in the uh, dynamic compression group. This is pioneered really by Peter, John, and Dane, and some strong collaboration as well from the DFT quantum simulation group at Stanimir. And then another thing I'm going to do a plug here is this very recent and new talented team at CMAP. I don't know if you guys have heard about this or not. So we just came from an intense proposal writing for the last six months. But uh, there's a new center, a new physics frontier center by NSF called Matter at Atomic Pressures. And if someone is wondering what is atomic pressures, it's a quantum unit of pressure when you divide the Hartley energy by the, the Bohr radius. And so if you do this for a hydrogen atom, you get something like 300 megabar. And this is the pressure that is required to seriously disrupt the shell in, in, in a hydrogen system, for example. And so it's probably one of the, the few frontiers that have not been explored experimentally and theoretically that much. We've explored the units of time, explored the units of, uh, of space and quantum, but as far as pressure, there hasn't been a lot of activity. And so thankfully we managed to convince the NSF that this is a great opportunity to connect with various community, especially given this explosion in the field of exoplanet designs. And so a great team. Um, I'm, I'm happy actually to say that a lot of members of this team you can recognize as graduates of the G at the Carnegie. And so Sarah Stewart, Burkhard Militzer, I think Sarah Seeger as well worked there, and then other folks as well. And so it really speaks to the, the amazing tradition that you guys have at the Carnegie in terms of being at the forefront 
in a lot of these fields. Um, one of the themes of this proposal of the, 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 the new NSF center is try to integrate the high pressure experiments and some of the analytical models and the ab initio calculation that goes with it with sort of planetary and stellar models and observations. And so we have a team that specializes in space observation. We have some specialized in the planetary modeling. And of course, the core expertise for the team at Rochester was sort of the high pressure experiment itself. Um, so LLE is a university-based uh, research center. It's probably the largest in scale for, uh, for high energy lasers. Uh, the lab has three main missions. The first one is inertial confinement fusion, the realization of fusion in the laboratory by methods we call indirect fusion. Um, we specialize in experiments and modeling and diagnostic, but mainly we run the Omega laser, which is the largest laser in, a, in an academic facility. It's the second largest in the world after the, the NIF um, laser, which happens to be in Livermore, California. A major component of what we do as well is the high energy density physics. And um, this is a buzzword in case you haven't heard of it. It just means high pressures and high temperatures. Uh, it's a regime where there is a lot of partial ionization, a strong coupling, some sort of degeneracy action that makes the description of the model very hard and makes the experiments more challenging. To support the inertial confinement and to support the, the development of high energy, we need to do a lot of experiments. We need to devise new tools to understand how matters behave and then how to create new states of matter as well. Uh, the, the last aspect is laser technology, and this is perhaps the least relevant for this audience before, but just as a matter of scales about what the Omega laser is, this is 60 beams uh, that is able to deliver 30 kilojoule of UV light on a central target at the target chamber. And just for scale, uh, the one laser beam can probably be about 30 to 40 meters. And so this occupies two buildings and there's a lot of laser technology that goes into that. And we're so happy actually that uh, the way we generate this high energy laser was awarded the Nobel Prize last year the, um, by the amplification of laser modulation by higher frequency. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? So this is more themes than actually outlines. And I'll start by saying one of the themes that I always appreciated is that I believe that our talks provoke more questions than answers. And I'm gonna try to do that. And so my hope is that if you come out to the rest of the day and you're sort of hopefully not that confused, but if you have more questions that you have, so like, oh, we figured this out, probably I did a slightly better job. Uh, the second theme, which I'm going to try to touch multiple times, is that from this from astrophysical sort of tradition, a lot of our understanding about planets and planetary objects comes from a space observation that is remote. And so most of our understanding about planets, even including Earth, comes from this remote observation. Uh, and so if you talk to a normal astrophysicist, they will say like, oh, we measure the mass, we measure the radius, we have some inf stellar information about the atmosphere. And so either we have a flyby mission or a radio, uh, uh, some radio observation or a remote survey. But what people sometimes do not appreciate as much is that most of these surface phenomena that we observe are actually shaped by internal processes. And, and as far as for those internal processes, the materials that shape how these processes behave, either the magma generation, the magnetic field generation, plate tectonics, you name your favorite phenomena, is actually affected by how matter behave at extreme conditions. And so, as it turns out, and you guys probably know this, the most of our audience, our knowledge of the material properties at these conditions remains severely limited. And you can pick your favorite phenomenology and then associate it with whatever order parameter, whatever quantity that we can measure, either from transport, from density, from viscosity, and say there's really not a whole lot of measurement that has been done. So given these two themes, I'm gonna have two main sort of examples that I'll try to drill down on. And the first one is a topic that's very close to my heart. I work in this probably through my PhD as well. It has to do with uh, the conductivity of dense fluid hydrogen. And so the question here is that, what exactly is the conductivity of dense fluid hydrogen at condition that's relevant to gas giants? And can it explain the depth of zonal length or the dynamo origin in both of the giants? And by the giants, I mean our own solar giants. Uh, can a stratified conductive fluid, the way that the conductivity actually differ across the Jupiter adiabat, can it explain this recent observation of the blue magnetic spot? And if you guys haven't heard about it, I'm gonna briefly touch on that or the fact that the, we have this anomalous asymmetric field in Saturn, which we thought to be at the twin of Jupiter. And so the fact that the two planets are very different is sort of really intriguing. 
how many dynamos exist in Jupiter? Uh, there has been a lot of recent speculation about the fact that we can have two dynamos, a shallow dynamo and a deep-seated dynamo. And of course, it has to do with how the conductivity evolves. How does the conductivity affect this helium ring? This phenomena that we sort of attribute the difference in the luminosity for the two planets to. The second question, or the second perhaps theme, is has to do more with rocky type of planets. And so, what is the ultimate phase relations and thermal transport properties of iron at subloys? And it's a it's sort of a topic that I know a lot of friends and colleagues at the, the Carnegie have actually done a lot of pioneering work on. I know Gonshroff has done some studies on that. But the, ultimately, how do these relationships and thermal transport properties affect the dynamo actions, internal layers, and the thermal states of this massive Earth-like planets? So I'm going to start with the first one, and not just not a reminder, but something that you guys already know is that there have been this explosion and discoveries of exoplanets. I think the last time you checked the census, perhaps 4,500, uh, depends which week you have. Most of these planets have internal conditions in what we call this atomic pressures, very high pressures. And so the plot that I'm showing here on the left is actually a compendium for some of the planets that we discovered using the normal mass radius relationship. And on the light, the color scale is actually the central pressure inside some of those planets. You will see that we have a, a sort of a bias in terms of the observation because most of the Jupiter type of planets are close to their stellar companions. And so we see them more clearly in the observation just because of their size and mass and the way they affect the the drop in the, in the emission coming from the sun. But there's also a lot of planets that are discovered in this regime, which we call mini Neptunes or Uranus and Neptune type water type planets. And then if you go further down, there are some planets that are discovered that we think are more Earth-like. Um, and so for most of these planets, the pressure inside them are extremely high. Um, some of the, the extrasolar Jupiter type planets have pressures that can reach up with maybe more than 80 or 90 megabars. And you start talking about what is the bound for being defined as a planet. And so the plot that I have here on the left is the, just a phase diagram showing the temperature as a function of pressure and putting the central pressure inside some of these planets. You start with this, the large IC satellites where you get a, a pressure of about less than a fraction of, of a megabar, maybe something in the range of <clears throat> 0 0.01 to 0.01 to 0.1 megabar. And then we have the Earth and the central pressure of the Earth is about 3.6 megabar. You get to super Earth and you can touch something between 10 to maybe 12 megabar. And then we have Jupiter, perhaps about 40 megabars, and you go up to 10 Jupiter mass. And then the upper pl planetary limit is something that's, it's not clearly defined what is the upper planetary limit for that. People say that maybe nine to 13 Jupiter mass. This will become important when we talk about the magnetic field generation, since there's a lot of discussion about how the magnetic field in these upper bodies, because some of them think, them think of them as many suns. And so we shouldn't apply the normal planetary phenomena that we understand to describe the magnetic field of these bodies. But at any rate, going up high, you get to the sun, which is of course is not a planet, and the temperature there probably can reach a, more than a million, and the central pressure here is maybe 10 to the five megabar. So let's, let's drill down at the first point, was the conductivity of dense fluid hydrogen. One of the most exciting uh, uh, sort of update that happens in our understanding of the giant planet is the, uh, the Juno mission. Not only the Juno mission, we also have the Cassini mission, which ended last two years ago, but the Cassini grand finale, which was opening Saturn. Uh, the great thing about the Juno mission is that it have a close polar orbit, meaning that it can sit very close to the planet Jupiter and then map both the gravity data and the magnetic field. And then eventually as it dives inside the planet, we hope to get a lot of information about the, the atmosphere of Jupiter, in particular, the big problems of water distribution in the same clouds. Um, but if you talk to the Juno gravity team or talk to people in the Juno mission, this is something that we do pretty regularly because we have strong collaboration with them. One of the more striking revelation of perhaps a success for the Juno mission is that there's this very old question about the depth of the zonal winds. For you guys who have studied giant planets, the, the zonal winds, I mean, the most prominent feature of Jupiter, if you just look from a telescope, and this is something that's been recognized from the 17th century, is these sort of bands 
uh, the, light, the, the dark bands are zones, the light bands are belt. These are est, east, to when, uh, east to west jet streams that travel across the planet. So it's very high speed, reaching in Jupiter something about 100 meters per second. And in Saturn, it can go up to 400 meters per second. For probably the last 40 years, there have been a raging debate in the field of planetary science about how deep do these zonal winds penetrate inside the atmosphere. And there have been two opposing opinions. The first is that the zonal wind phenomena are sort of confined to the very, very upper envelope of the hydrogen envelope inside the planets. And so if you were to dive inside, you would not feel the, feel, you would not feel the, the, the wind or the flow. And then the flow would actually damp down very fast. The other camp would argue is that the zonal winds are very deeply seated and they would actually penetrate much deeper into the planet. Well, thankfully we have the Juno mission which uh, came into orbit in 2016. And one of the revelations that came by measuring the, the gravitational data, the even harmonic data and the, digital, and the odd harmonic data, you can think of a planet as a, as, a, as a rigid body. And then if you measure the gravity field, you can actually discern what the, mag the, the gravitational moments are. And these moments, you can measure them up to an accuracy of probably less than 0.1 to 0.0%. One of the things that the Juno mission have done is that increase the accuracy by almost a factor of six. And so we get the, the J gravitational harmonics and the odd gravitational harmonics, and we use them to understand the deep interior type of the planet, whether the planet is entirely rotating as a rigid body, or you get some stratification where part of the planet is moving fast, other part of the planet is not moving as fast. And so the observation is there is that the deep interior of the planet is actually rotating as the rigid body, but there's a very strong differential rotation that happens at the atmosphere, which penetrates into the planet until it reaches this rigid body. What does that mean? It means that the, um, the zonal wind actually extend to the depth of the planet to maybe up to 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers, which is amazing. I mean, you have these, you can think of them as like hurricane-like phenomena that occurs in atmosphere, and they extend for thousands of kilometers inside the deep of the planet. Now, of course, for you guys who have done some magnetohydrodynamic sort of analysis, you know that because hydrogen start conducting inside the planet, there's some conductivity that happens in the internal. And so at some point, the wind inside the planet itself will reach a level where the conductivity of hydrogen is doing some inductive heating and ohmic dissipation. You have a fluid that's conducting, which is hydrogen. It's rotating at very fast speed rest speed, it generates some ohmic dissipation, and this ohmic dissipation cannot exceed the luminosity of the planet. And so the conductivity of hydrogen will set an upper limit about how far the depth of the zonal wind can actually penetrate. And so knowing what we know now, this is a, a plot that people a lot of time use, the one that I'm showing on the right, it shows how the, uh, the, the most plausible explanation for the harmonic data, the even harmonic data from the J2, the J10, matches an internal profile of the wind penetrating up to a depth of maybe 3,000 to 3,600. And then showing here is the values where people think that the conductivity of the dense hydrogen are sufficient enough to start putting a damp for how far these zonal winds can penetrate. And so a great example of how a surface phenomena is actually deeply affected by what happened inside the planets. And the, the, the property here is the dense hydrogen conductivity. And so all of this was cool. Uh, we have a compounding problems for this, which is that the conductivity of hydrogen is also the reason that we have the magnetic field or the dynamo action inside Jupiter. And also because of Juno, the magnetic models of these giants are, are, are a topic of considerable scrutiny because the new data from both Juno and Cassini are actually giving very different pictures from what we understood from the planets. And so one of the, uh, the striking sort of observation from the magnetic data on Juno is that we have this asymmetry in terms of the hemispheric dichotomy of the Jupiter magnetic field, something that the people are calling the pool magnetic spots. So these are magnetic field lines. They're coming out from the, from the hot part and they're going into the blue part. And then when they're mapped this planets, given, I think they had six polar orbits at the time, where they discovered is that there's this dichotomy that parts of the planet has more field lines going through it than other parts of the planet. And so you think of it as a dipole and then you try to have a space mission and you measure this dipole. And it turns out it's not exactly a perfect dipole. 
part of the hemisphere has more magnetic field line coming out from it. And so this asymmetry or dichotomy is something that has been observed in Jupiter. And we really don't have an explanation for why this line, do, line dipolar effect is happening. We don't have an explanation for why it, it happens in the southern atmosphere. And so if you read the papers, and this is something that I've always marveled at, a lot of the people when they see a space observation, especially in giant planets that we don't understand, they say, well, it has to do with the interior. What exactly does it have to do with the interior? And so the most plausible explanation people give is that maybe the, the conductivity of hydrogen inside the planet itself is stratified in a way that it will give rise to this effect. The problem is that why would the effect be actually in one of the hemisphere but not the other is not exactly clear. What kind of stratification and the conductivity of hydrogen is required to give rise to this effect is also not clear. Um, as far as Saturn, Saturn has always been an enigma uh, as far as its magnetic field. Uh, for you, most of you guys, you know that the, uh, the magnetic field line on the spin axis, the rotation axis of the planet, for most of the planet, this is more or less very well aligned. The problem is Jupiter the, is, is not very well aligned. And so for Earth, it's like 10 degrees from the magnetic field line and the rotation axis of the planet. Uh, for Earth, it's more or less like Jupiter, maybe 12 or nine, I can't remember the exact number. But for Saturn, it's perfectly aligned. So the rotation axis of the planet and its magnetic field line are almost perfectly aligned. It's actually aligned within 0.01 degree. Um, it turns out that in terms of classic magnetohydrodynamics, it is the Inkhong theorem, which says that this is not allowed. If we understand how dynamo action works, then no planet will have a magnetic field line that is perfectly aligned with its rotation axis. And so, but yet we have observed this in Saturn. And our understanding is that Saturn is just a, a smaller part of Jupiter. It just, it has exactly the same composition, perhaps formed not very far after Jupiter is formed, but yet we see it's a magnetic field, which is very, very different than any other planet we have observed before. The, uh, the culprit here, and I will, again, if you read some of these papers, they would say, well, there must be something happening in the interior. The conductivity of dense hydrogen, the fluid hydrogen inside the planet is probably stratified in a way that will give rise to this effect. Well, the problem is that we have the same phase diagram for hydrogen and it should apply to both planets. And so the fact that we have this sort of dichotomy or dispersion in terms of how the same phase diagram will give rise to very, very different magnetic field line is sort of um, kind of problematic. And um, it challenges a lot of our understanding of not just the dynamo theory, but of the way we understand the, the, how the field originates from the conductivity of hydrogen. Okay, so I'm not gonna address how we can solve that because I think that's still a longstanding problem, but I'm gonna address slightly how can we get better clues about this. And so, Hydrogen is something I've worked on for, for a lot of years, and I know some of the colleagues at the, the Carnegie have also done the same. So what we started out doing is that we collected all the high pressure data uh, that had been collected from several experimental platforms, gas gun, laser, laser compression, static, uh, diamond anvil cell, high temperature, low temperature, and we tried to match all of that data that happened to be close enough to the Jupiter adiabat. And our aim there was that to construct a conductivity profile for hydrogen across Jupiter and see what sort of results can get if we have this conductivity profile. Uh, the, the plot that I'm showing here to the left is showing the, uh, the hydrogen phase diagram, but in terms of electric conductivity as a function of radial distance. And so you can think of the radial distance as also pressure. This is, of course, the core of the planet, and this is the outer. So hydrogen started out as an insulator, and then at some point, not very far, which is something that's actually very challenging, is that you get very steep precipitous rise of the conductivity across the adiabat. So perhaps about 0.97 or 0.96, the band gap of the, uh, the hydrogen itself in the fluid phase, it started being close enough and then the molecules start being disrupted because of the effect of pressures and temperature and you start having some partial ionization and dissociation. This because if you have some free electrons in the system, you start conducting and you can actually say, well, we're gonna approximate this regime of partial ionization as a semiconductor. If you keep compressing and heating it further, uh, you start metallizing hydrogen. It's old, good problems of hydrogen metallization that has been very contentious for years, but we know it has to happen and the conductivity has to reach values that are really high. 
And so this is a collection of some of the experiments that we have done using static work. And it actually shows that the connectivity of hydrogen is much higher than what the, the, the DFT density functional theory have been sort of calculating across the, the Jupiter adiabat. This is the group of um, Redmar et al. in the University of Rostock in Germany. And what, what they were seeing is that we're seeing connectivity of hydrogen that almost a factor of, uh, of two or three higher than what the DFT is predicting. Now, in the regime of the partial dissociation and ionization, you're seeing that the discrepancy between the experiment and the theory is not really that high, but it starts to diverge more when we reach the conducting core of the planet. I'm also showing here um, one for you guys who do conductivity profile, what we call the minimum metallic conductivity, uh, which is this concept that the conductivity will saturate because of the effect of temperature. You can call it resist resistivity saturation. And the idea is there is that as the electrons are bouncing between the, the, the atoms or the ions, there is an ultimate sort of distance between how far they can travel considering the compressibility of the fluid or the lattice if you have a solid. And so it cannot be higher, or the, 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 the travel distance cannot be higher than the interatomic distance between the ions. And so it sets some sort of a, an upper limit for what the, the, the values of the conductivity can reach. And it seems that hydrogen has actually challenged that. So this minimum metallic conductivity, the values that we're getting are actually much higher. So hydrogen is a good metal at these conditions. Um, as far as the planet is concerned, most of, the, most of the discrepancy actually comes from our poor understanding of this regime, this sort of partial ionization and dissociation. And so even so I'm showing the data points here, we would really like to have more fidelity and precision in terms of data. This is a gas gun data that was collected in 1986 that I personally have reason to doubt what exact value that it yield, but uh, it is the only thing that we have. It's about pressures of 20 GPA or 25 GPA and the temperature of 3000 Kelvin, but we really don't have any measurement in that sort of region. However, uh, do not despair. If you take all these measurements and you fit them, you can get this profile. And so we're going to use this profile of conductivity that we sort of derive from all the experimental data and see if we can understand more about the, uh, the, the, the dynamo field. Oh, my slide sort of, all right. Uh, and I'm showing here in the light, right, this is more a physics point that this regime is not really a semiconducting regime. You have to understand more about the dissociation because if you fit it with a semiconductor, which is showing in the red here, it doesn't fit the data. Okay, so if we combine the, the wind profile data that Juno provided with the conductivity data that we just derived, we can arrive at a plot like this. And so this is showing electrical conductivity as a function of radial distance. And the flow decay profile is from the center of the, from the uh, surface of the planet going up to 0.94. This is the 3000 kilometer when the wind speed reach about one meter per second, which is actually still pretty high. Uh, and so this is plotted against the conductivity profile that goes up from this 10,000 semi per centimeters, almost going to a factor of one. Uh, and we think that this is the regime that actually where the dynamo originates. Uh, for you guys who do some sort of dynamo, the, uh, in order to have a dynamo, the magnetic Reynolds number need to be sufficiently high. It's not entirely clear in the literature what is sufficiently high, but people say somewhere between 10 to 100. Uh, we choose 40 for some reason of a collaboration that we sort of had. And so the idea is there is that if you know the convective velocity, which June gives you, and then you know something about the conductivity, uh, this LR is the conductivity scale highest, it's just the conductivity over the, the gradient of the conductivity was, was depth, and you try to calculate the magnetic diffusivity, which is only a function of the conductivity. And so in order to derive this RM number, the magnetic Reynolds number, all you need to do is to know the convective flow, flow inside the planet and also know the, the conductivity. And if you choose your favorite value, somewhere between 10 to 100, you can actually say, okay, at, a, at, at this depth, the value of the magnetic numbers is going to be sufficient to actually generate the dynamo. And so even though it's a very simplistic analysis, it turns out to be very powerful at sort of understanding where the dynamo actually originates by combining the conductivity and the flow decay. The, the diagram I'm showing on the right could be more illustrative. And so it shows how the, the different layers inside the planet are affected just by the conductivity of hydrogen. You start by the molecular insulating, as I showed in the phase diagram, and then it becomes semiconducting, even though it's not exactly semiconducting. Uh, and then somewhere between 0.95 RG and 0.9 uh, 
uh, to RJ, you have the origin of the dynamo, which I'm showing by this R dynamo. Okay, so this is great. So we can identify somewhere between 0.95 and 0.92 as a plausible origin of the dynamo. It turns out that if you, uh, if you scan the literature for what people have been prescribing the origin of the dynamo in Jupiter, you get results that varies from 0.95 to almost 0.75. And the reason that people have had this discrepancy or dispersion is that they were using the conductivity of hydrogen as a free parameter because there was so much we didn't understand when these models were developed. People didn't want to pinpoint an exact depth origin for where the dynamo originate. But now that we have slightly better understanding of hydrogen conductivity, we can actually say with some sort of fatality that the, the field is actually going to originate at about 0.9 to 0.95. Just to give a comparison for Earth, this is very, very close to the surface having a field that originate that much closer to the surface. It means that the, the magnetic harmonics that you can observe are gonna be very, the dipolar components or the magnet pole components, the higher order components are gonna be very pronounced. And so this is something that Juno is actually sensitive to. And uh, the sort of working understanding right now from Juno is that maybe the field is actually much closer to 0.94 or 0.95. Uh, there's, Another thing, if, if you guys, if someone is interested in the, the dynamo theory, you can use what's called the white noise sort of measurement from Juno to gain better understanding of where the field originate. And this is something interesting that we can talk about. But um, moving forward, so if we understand where the field originate for Jupiter, how about all the Jupiter-like planets? And so we set out to do that. We say, okay, we have some sort of working knowledge of the conductivity. The Juno data provides us with some baseline for the conductive flow. Can we actually, if we say that the, the field in Jupiter originates that close to the surface, 0.95, can we understand where it originates in a whole lot of other planets, which is extrasolar giant, the Jupiter-like planets? And so in order to do that, we had to do some uh, sort of modeling to understand how these planets radiate heat. You have to understand something about the convective flow. And so how do you calculate the convective flow uh, inside these tidally locked planets, you can use the mixing length theory. So the mixing length theory tells you that if, the, uh, if, the, if there's no turbulent convection, the length of the layer will be actually smaller than the convective length. And so you can calculate that using uh, some models that were developed by Adam Burrs at Princeton. Um, I don't wanna unload a lot of the details. It's just a bunch of equation that allows you to calculate the convective flow, which was measured for Jupiter and relate that to the luminosity and also to the convective heat flux at the boundary of the planet. This is how much the planet is actually convecting or how much the planet is actually radiating in terms of heat at its surface. And you can this as a function of time. Uh, and so I have calculated that for one Jupiter mass, five Jupiter mass and 10 Jupiter mass. And so also the convective velocities and we don't know if the mixing length theory is actually a good approximation, but it's probably one of the only frameworks that we have that we can rely on to do that. Okay, so now that we have what the flow velocity in all of these extrasolar giants are, and we have the conductivity of hydrogen, which we assume is going to be the same for all the planets because it is hydrogen, same phase diagram. So what we sort of, now that we have these two pieces, we can calculate where the dynamo originates, or the poloidal dynamo originates in these more massive giant planets. And so this is, show, this is a plot showing R dynamo over RP, RP is just the, the radius of the planet, over the, how many Jupiter mass this planet is. And I'm showing them for two range of radius. One of them is R equal RG and the other one is R equal 1.3. Uh, and this is just a polynomial uh, fit to the data. Uh, the more striking part is that for the more massive planets, maybe about three or four Jupiter mass, the field is actually about 0.97 to 0.98 meaning that the dynamo originates in these giant planets very, very close to the surface. We already know that Jupiter was close enough, about 0.92 or 0.95, but for some of these planets, the, the dynamo itself is actually about 0.98 or 0.99, which is extremely close uh, to the surface. This can have a lot of implications about the, the magnetosphere of these planets. For those that are tightly locked, it can have a lot of implication of how these planets interact with the stellar companions as I explained, the, uh, the, this phenomena of ohmic dissipation, the, the interaction between the field and between the zonal flow 
uh, the convective flow in these planets is, is going to dissipate a lot of heat. And so what I haven't done here, and this is a work in progress, is that now that we have some sort of framework to understand where the field originates, uh, we can calculate what the omic dissipation is. And the, 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 the reason that we can do that is that this sets a limit on the luminosity of these planets. And so in cases where we don't have some sort of a, a measurement or an observation about the luminosity of these extrasolar giants, you can actually use the phase diagram of hydrogen and some analytical model that gives you the convective velocity and put some upper bound on how much omic dissipation happen very close to the surface. I should mention also that this is really interesting because there have been some recent suggestions that you can have these atmospheric generated toroidal types of dynamos in hot Jupiter. And so we could be speaking of different types of planets that are Jupiter-like, which has a poloidal dynamo and also a toroidal dynamos in their atmosphere. This concept of atmospheric dynamo is, is something that, of course, we're not very familiar with in our solar system. But it seems that based on some, some of the models and the results that I'm showing right now is that you can have almost surface-based dynamos uh, magnetic field generation in some of these extra short giants, which is quite intriguing and, and really different from the way we have it in our solar system. Uh, okay, so, so far we have calculated where the field originate. The, one of the obvious questions that you can ask, how about the strength of the field itself? So you told us that it might be very close to the surface, 0.95 to 0.98, but what is the strength of the field itself? So this is another area that you really need to understand what the material properties is. Uh, there are two frameworks to calculate the strengths of fields using the dynamo theory. One of them is called the force balance, which is that the, the, the mag balance that the, the Coriolis force, the buoyancy force, the pressure force have to equate, and this will give rise to the dynamo field. Uh, it turns out in, in the force balance sort of framework, it's very material sensitive, it's very rotation sensitive, and so you need to know the orbital period of the planet and you need to know the transport properties inside the planet. There is another framework which is saying that if the planet is rotating fast enough and it's convecting enough, you really don't need the material properties on the planet. And so the sort of two opposing framework are right now being tested. And then thankfully, we can offer some sort of tools by prediction that the force balance is gonna give you this result, the energy balance give you this result, and it's gonna be up for observationals to go out and then if they see some radio emission that relates to the magnetic field saying, by the way, this force balance might work for planets of this mass and the energy balance can work at this. And so the plot that I'm showing in the left is actually using the energy balance. The energy balance is dependent on the, on the, the, uh, the age of the planet itself. And I'm calculating them for different planets of different Jupiter masses and different sort of radial masses. Um, and of course, as you can see that the, the magnetic moment of the planet, which is just the field times the radius uh, cube, is the highest in the more massive planets. And then for the Jupiter-like planets, it's actually lower. It also depends on the age, meaning that for young planets, the, the magnetic moment or the magnetic field is actually the highest. And at the planet age, its dynamo effect is actually gonna grow lower and lower. This is something that you don't get from this force balance. And so for the force balance, it has been, there have been a lot of analytical relations on how to calculate this. Uh, you pick your favorite. There's work that was done by Pusey in early 1960. Stevenson has a formula. Sano has a formula. Sasser, which is this, again, how the force balance framework was actually developed. And so you can see how the, the magnetic moment as a function of the, uh, the, the, the planet mass times its radius. The way it's plotted this way is that we have experimented with a lot of sort of what is the, the, what is the, the observable parameter from the planet itself that sort of correlated the most was the magnetic moment. And yes, you can say it's, it's the mass times the radius, but what exactly is the mass times two of the radius times three of the radius? And so we have derived some analytical relationship that gives the best fit for these planets. I should note here that at ages similar to our solar age, this 4.5 billion years, the extrasolar giant with similar mass and radius to Jupiter between the two frameworks are actually quite similar. And so this is, again, <laughs> a very interesting thing for those of you who work in exoplanets is that we base most of our understanding of our solar planets. And so if we have a framework that works for solar planets, we try to extrapolate this for extrasolar planets. And the problem here is that we're not sure if this uh, extrapolation would actually work. But this is one of the, the, the attempts to actually see if it does. 
Uh, so for planets that are of the same age to our solar system, there's a broad agreement between the two frameworks. But for planets that are much younger here, this energy balance uh, yields magnetic moments that are actually 10 to 100 times higher than that. Okay, so the last piece of this very, the very first example about Jupiter type of planet is that now that we have the magnetic moments or, or the, the magnetic field strength, and now that we have some understanding about where in the planet does this field originate? Is there an observable parameter that people can go out and measure that would actually tell them if the magnetic field is actually what we think it is? And it turns out it is because for, um, for most of the planets that have strong magnetic field, they actually have a magnetosphere. And this magnetosphere interacts with the stellar winds, which is the solar companions or the solar light companions that these planets have. And because of this interaction, the electrons is going to be accelerated toward the oral region, giving something that's called the electron cyclotron frequency. And so there's an emission band in the radio frequency that will actually originate because of the interaction of the magnetic field with the stellar winds if there's some free electrons in the atmosphere. And so we know that this works for Jupiter, we know it works for Saturn, we know that it works for Sun and brown dwarfs and sort of more massive planets, but we don't really have any observation right now about the radio frequency that's emitted because of the magnetic field in this planet. It turns out you can calculate it if you know something about the, the dipole magnetic field of the planet. This is the maximum free cyclotron frequency, radio frequency that you can get. Uh, it also, this is the power of the, the emitted uh, sort of radio frequency that you can measure. And it, of course, as you imagine, it does depend on the planet star distance separation. And so what I'm showing here on the right is um, the peak cyclotron frequency as a function of the magnetic moments for a lot of the planets. This is about 140 planets. All the, all the Jupiter-like planets that we, uh, we got from the sensors where there was a documented mass and radius and other properties that we use. And so we sort of placed some predictions on the, the maximum sort of radio cyclotron frequency that will sort of emanate from the planet given what we just mentioned about where the field originate and how strong the field is. The great thing about this is that there's a lot of spectroscopic surveys that are gonna go on in the last five or six years. And so we're really hoping that maybe if we get the first observation of the radio frequency coming out from some of these planets, we'll go back to the two frameworks and try to understand whether actually the energy balance framework is more favorable or the force balance framework is more favorable. And so it really helps understand, uh, helps us further understand how the dynamo theory actually work, given that we only have our own solar system and the sun, but we don't know how the dynamo theory can work for these other planets. An exercise like the one I just described can actually place some bounds and sort of help us understand the dynamo theory even for planets like Earth. Okay, so what is the time here? I, I'm in presenter mode. If someone can help me, is it nine? How, how much time do I have? You still got 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, so the second theme here is for more rocky type planets. And this is an area that I'm sure there's a lot of expertise in the audiences. And so phase and thermal transport properties of iron and alloys and silicate as well. And then try to understand if we know this, what will be the dynamo action in the thermal states of the more massive Earth-like planets. Uh, I don't need to remind this audience, but I've always uh, liked to have a slide like this is that the, the atmosphere of Earth and sort of this habitable environment that we have here on our planet, this very, very, very thin veneer where we actually interact with everything that's living, atmosphere, liquid water, surface temperature, actually originate from the high pressure interiors. And so um, I don't need to go through this, but from the plate tectonics to outgassing sort of recycling, a lot of these phenomena that we have in the atmosphere are actually very connected to sort of processes like viscosity and buoyancy, to processes like partial melting, to processes like transport properties, to processes like uh, chemical differentiation or crystal settling. And all of this will happen in the interior of the planet. And so under further understanding all of these transport about the, the, the water cycle or the carbon cycle, how do planets maintain and sequester water and carbon, is actually very connected from the, the atmosphere point of the planet to its deep interior. And there's so many questions that we have here, which is sort of don't understand 
time. But it's another very good example of how if we just measure properties in the surface, we really need to understand more what happens in the interiors. One of my favorite example actually, and this is a slightly contentious topic since we don't know how the magnetic field can actually contribute to the habitability. But if we take the example of the carbon cycle and the magnetic protection, and we sort of lay out the terrestrial solar type of planets, and so this is Venus, Earth, and Mars, Venus and Mars sort of have a similar sort of atmospheric uh, CO2 contribution, about 95%. Earth has an, uh, a CO2 atmospheric partial pressure of about 0.0004 atom. Um, we think, or we would like to think, uh, depending on who you talk to, that the carbon cycle and the magnetic field protection, the magnetic field, are actually sort of somehow connection, but by the thermal convection models that happen inside the interior of the planet. And so even though the carbon cycle and the magnetic field might not be very connected, they're actually key processes that will give rise to an atmosphere in a planet. And so if the planet has an atmosphere, this will probably be an uh, environment that's more amenable to have a, a habitability inside of this planet. And so I would be shy from saying that having a magnetic field is absolutely a necessity for habitability. But nonetheless, we know that having a magnetic field will sort of protect the planet from this atmospheric erosion. And this is an example that happens, for example, in Mars, where because the, the magnetic field sort of died, the planet lost its atmosphere. So if we know what we know now about the internal structure of Earth, and we sort of extrapolate that to Earth-like planets, sort of going from one Earth mass to 10 Earth mass, the plot I'm showing here is, of course, you have Tom Duffy. Uh, I'm sure that Sally have seen that before. But let's assume that this, the, the rocky type planets emerged in stellar system with very similar elemental composition. This is actually a point that I'm going to argue against in the, in the later part of the talk. But just for, uh, for, 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 uh, for the sake of curiosity here, if we think that some planets, which again, it's going to be very true, emerged in very similar environment and very similar composition than the Earth. So what, what do we expect? So this is going from the, 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 the sort of silicate mantle and all the phase transition that happens in the upper mantle going to the lower mantle. We don't know if there, there's going to be some dissociation between the MgSi3, the sort of bridge monion, does it break in MgO plus MgSi205? Is there sort of some other phases that we don't really understand that happen at this more or less one TPA. What happens about the iron alloy as well? Is it liquid? Is it solid? At what pressure do we need to know the iron phase diagram in order to say that for a planet that's five Earth mass versus six Earth mass, this can have a liquid iron, this cannot have. And so I outlined here what I call the big unknowns of things that we would really don't know, but we'd really like to do to, to know about uh, these sort of massive rocky type planets. The first question, and perhaps the most obvious, is that does these planets have feature plate tectonics? So this, of course, will depend on the viscosity of the silicate. And we don't really have a good framework for understanding how viscosity works at high pressure and high temperature. You can have these sort of activation type analytical models that describe if you heat the material by a thousand Kelvin, its viscosity is going to decrease by that order, but the effect of density and temperature is not really understood. The second unknown is the thermal history and dynamics. And of course, this will depend on the melting relations of the silicate and the iron. And the third question is the magnetic field, and this will depend on the electron conductivity of dense liquid iron. So, our work here has been to have a lot of experiments, both on NEF and Omega, dynamic compression experiments that will sort of provide some of the key thermophysical data for either silicate or iron, and try to put that into a model to answer some part of these questions for Earth-type planets. And so this is an experiment that, uh, that was done by Ray Smith and our collaborators between Rochester and, uh, and uh, Lawrence Livermore. Uh, for you guys who haven't seen that, this is a whole room or actually used for fusion, but Ray and others have developed this platform that allows you to actually measure the equation of state and the sound velocity of the step target, something that looks like this. Um, I'm going to spend probably a minute explaining in a very briefly what's an indirect drive. So there's a whole room. The whole room is actually being heated by laser beams. You see these laser beams and this ultraviolet beams that comes here. This heats the whole room and the heat is being converted to X-ray 
x-ray hits the sample and drives a shock and the shock is sort of propagates into the material and sort of compresses and heats it and because we have ultra fast diagnostics sitting in the background using here we can actually track the velocity of the shock going on and we can actually get the thermal emission coming out that and so we can get uh, an e a measurement of the density and a measurement of the temperature and what, uh, what Ray have done here is that he have extended the sound velocity measurement as a function of density to pressure that actually goes up to almost 1.4 TPA, which is pretty, pretty high. And then using the measurements and the observable, you can actually back out a sort of granizing parameter, which I love because I'm gonna use this a lot in, in, in explaining how can we drive better melting relations and adiabatic relationship for ions. Um, and so if you have more questions about how this platform works, extremely powerful. Um, and this really opens a lot of opportunity for us to measure similar properties in other materials than iron as well. Okay, so the granizing parameter and the sort of density measurement that Ray has backed out and others have allowed us to get a better understanding of the melting line and the adiabatic profile of iron. If you guys are familiar with this is the, just the Lindemann relationship for the melting line of irons and I'm showing here a phase diagram. It's a lot of measurement that I'm not showing here. I'm sorry if some of yours does not show up. Uh, a PT plot. The red uh, line here is just using this relationship and the Grunizen parameter was the density that we got from the NIF experiment and trying to see what the melting line looks like at really high pressure, maybe going up to 40 or 50 megabar. As you can see that as far as the DFT work, which is uh, this work by Morad et al. 2011, uh, it matches this extrapolation pretty well. And so I, I, I think the measurement actually of the Grunizen parameter and the density, they have done some good job. And so some sort of a broad agreement between the extrapolation and between some of the already available data. Um, of course, Earth or Earth type planets are not purely iron. And so you have to depress the melting line by adding these impurities. Uh, we don't know exactly what sort of impurities you need to add, but I mean, you can use the Gibbs free energy to see the depression in the melting line. Usually you get something like 10 to 15% depression. Um, I know that if I'm talking to an Earth, for Earth scientists, when I say 10 to 15, I was like, oh, this is a huge difference. But for the purpose of exoplanets exercise, this difference might not be huge. Going in a melting line, the difference between uh, 1.2 uh, or 12,000 12, Kelvin to 1,100 20, for example. Uh, the interesting thing that I should point out is that the adiabat of iron is actually much shallower than the melting line. And so the gradient of the adiabatic temperature in relation to the melting line will determine the thermodynamic state, whether the planet will have a solid or a liquid state inside of an interior. And you can already see that based on this, at pressures above 10 megabar, even higher than 10 megabar, uh, that there's going to be a very shallow adiabat for iron compared to its melting line. There's also going to be a shallow adiabat for iron compared to the, the melting line of an iron alloy. Okay, so this is sort of interesting. Does that mean that planets, larger planets, does not have a liquid uh, iron core? You can say that because the core is coupled to the mantle, and so you need to build a thermal profile for the entire planet and see where the iron core sits if you actually want to make that sort of a uh, statement. And so we need better understanding of the silicate melting relations. This is where Fabrice and Omega experiment comes in. And again, uh, these are experiments using a platform we call a single shock decay. It was done in instatite MGSI3. Um, the conclusion of this experiment is that the melt line is actually much shallower than was previously reported before. Uh, the experiment shows this one data points. There's other data points that actually fold here. I'm not going to go into the experimental platform. It's very interesting. If you guys have more questions, we can talk about it later. But we managed to put an extra point, melting point, on the anastatide phase diagram, about 230 GPA, and it seems to be slightly less than 6,000 kilt. Okay, how about the rest of the silicates? So this is very another very recent work that we're doing in MGO. And actually one of the more striking revelations coming out is that the melting line of MGO is actually very, very shallow. Uh, and then there's a very huge latent heat. And so this is the MGO phase diagram. Uh, this is temperature as a function of pressure. Uh, this is 20,000 Kelvin, 10,000 Kelvin here. We have the B1, B2 phase. 
um, Sesame here, this is a tabular EUS. You guys know, don't need to worry too much about it. The DFT line is the red line here. And so we have a single shock, which comes, shocks the sample. And so and after the single shock, you can imagine that the laser compressed the sample. And as the sample is being compressed, we actually inject another laser pulse that do a second shock. And so we call this platform double shock. And what it allows you is that instead of riding this very high temperature, high pressure sort of thermodynamic path, it allows us to sort of tickle the sample to some initial high pressures of 100 GPA, and then inject another laser pulse that take the sample to much higher pressure, but lower temperature. And so this allows us to probe the melting line at the much, much higher pressures and lower temperature than it was done before. So for you guys who are familiar with the shock compression jargon, it allows us to ride a non-principal Higonio, which is the one that's shown in the green here. And though there's a bunch of data that we've been collecting over the last year and a half, and as you guys can see that the, there is, seems to be a very large latent heat. I should foretell that actually, or I shouldn't foretell that, we, dis we discovered this also in Diamond, and this is data that I'm not showing, is that it turns out there's a very large latent heat in other types of silicates as well. Uh, but this is really interesting. So even going up to 2000 GPA, the melting line really does not increase much. Okay, let's, let's put these things together there. So this is a collection for, uh, for all the silicate work and showing the, the melting lines of MgO, SiO2, MgSiO3. Uh, this is the data that I just showed you in the MgO, showing this plateauing in terms of the melting line going up to 11 megabar. The data for the SI2, this was omega data going up to 5.6 to 6 megabar. And so this is an extrapolation because we still haven't measured anything for SI2 above 7 megabar. MgSiO3, this is the data that I just showed two slides ago, showing a measurement to above 3 megabar. Um, the, the one that I'm showing on the right here, actually, this is a redundant plot. Uh, I just wanted to show the adiabat, calculated adiabat for MgSi3. Okay, so now that we have the melting lines and adiabats of iron and some silicate, let's calculate some thermal profile for Earth-like planets. Uh, so you can use the gradient of the adiabat to the radial profile. If you understand something about the density, the acceleration, the ignizing parameter, the adiabatic temperature in the bulk module, all of these things can be measured. And so you can calculate what this sort of thermal profile will look like. And I'm have, I have it here for one earth mass, two earth mass, five earth mass, and 10 earth mass. I'm overlaying here the sort of iron melting line. And so uh, there's sort of a th the, the only thermal boundary that I'm assuming here is that the entire planet is sort of convicting and that the core mantle boundary is the only barrier for conviction. I haven't added a lot of Fe uh, iron impurities to the melting line. I also assume that the, uh, the sort of a jump across the core mantle boundary is sort of a similar order of magnitude to Earth. There have been a lot of discussion in the literature whether the jump should sort of increase with the planetary mass. There are two opposing opinions, it's not clear. My assumptions, at least for this sort of exercise, is that if you take it to be the same. And so this is what, this is what you get, is that as the planets, as, as Earth's type like planets grow more massive, above two, uh, two Earth mass or five Earth mass, the, the adiabat of the iron is actually below the melting. Meaning that if these two can cross, the planet is not gonna have a liquid core. This is something that was sort of put forward initially, I think around 2015, when we sort of had better understanding of the melting line. But since there hasn't been a lot of understanding of the silicate sort of adiabat, this thermal picture is actually very powerful when you combine the adiabat of the silicates, the adiabat of iron, and the thermal sort of profiles for the, the iron and the silicate as well. And so I should note that this also does not account for giant impact, because if you have a giant impact in an early bombardment phase of the planet, the, er, the starting temperature here is of course gonna be higher. And so I assume that the surface temperature for all these planets uh, is about 300 Kelvin. And you can say, well, that doesn't make sense because a lot of these planets will be strong the tightly heated and strongly coupled. There's going to be an effect of a strong insulation. And so the, the surface temperature can be thousands of Kelvin. And so, and this is very true. If you actually heat, if you have the surface temperature much higher than whatever temperature required for liquid water, you can actually have the melting line crossing the adiabat and you can have a liquid core. However, if you're above 300 Kelvin, it's not a condition that's very good for habitability or for uh, the development of liquid water. 
Okay, the last thing that I want to touch on is that now that we have the thermal profiles of the planets, um, can we say something about, and I sort of not convinced it, but showed you a possibility where you can have planets, no massive planets that don't have liquid cores. What about the thermal states? What about for planets that can have liquid cores of iron? Can they actually be convecting or not? I see Sally looking up the clock and so I understand that I'm out of time. Yes, I'm out of time. I can run through that. I think you can um, you can keep on going for a couple of minutes, and if people need to if people need to check out check out, they can. So I, I, that's okay with me. So um. okay. Okay. So um, I don't need to explain that the the core convection will happen if the heat flow is larger than the adiabatic flow. You guys know that. Um, what I just want to point out is another exercise of how you can get the, uh, the electrical conductivity of liquid iron or of solid iron uh, using the block Eisen sort of relationship, if you know something about the divide temperature, the, the volume. And so this is using some of these parameters that we get from experiments and try to analytically sort of extrapolate to very high temperatures, high pressure, and see what the iron thermal conductivity is. Um, I'm using a model to, to to put it all together, whether the planet is going to be convicting or not, uh, there's this framework that was developed by Bruce Buffett, uh, and it tells you that the core cooling will direct the gravitational energy. This energy converts to ohmic dissipation, thermal convection, and the expulsion of this light elements from the, the solid core to the outer core is an additional energy source. And if you put all the sort of energy sources here that sort of give rise to convection, you can arrive in, a, in some this relation that release the total heat that's going to be radiated across or convected ac transported across the core to the uh, to the heat required to solidify the core and you can relate this to the the the, the the radial profile of the core itself, how big this core in, in some of these planets. I don't want to walk you through the mass, but this relation can be reduced to this. So delta T is the temperature drop across the core radius in an in a Earth-type planet. And it's related to the total heat, which is conducted across the core mountain boundary. And so thermal convection will occur in planets if the delta T is more than the adiabatic temperature. All the, the drop in the temperature across the core is higher than the adiabatic temperature, the, the, temp the heat that's being conducted just because of the thermal uh, conductivity. Uh, and this is, this is what you get. And so there is some sort of discrepancy about the value of the thermal conductivity on Earth. And that's a huge problem because it tells us how old the, the, the dynamo is, how big its core, what sort of its uh, thermal profile is. But let's say, okay, let's say, there are values that are 45 milliwatts per Kelvin. This is the value that I think Alex have uh, had uh, and Stuart McWilliams and others from the, the Carnegie. And there are other values that say it's about 100 to 120 milliwatts per Kelvin at 130 GPA. My point here is that because of the effect of pressure and the density and the higher temperature in these massive Earth type planets, these values are gonna increase. And so in a 10 Earth-like planet, if, the if, if one Earth mass is 45, at a 10 Earth mass, this is gonna be about 150. If you start with 130 at one Earth mass, at a 10 Earth mass, this is gonna be about 470 milliwatts. And so it turns out that you wouldn't have a thermal convection, even if you have a liquid iron core in the more massive planet. And so this is, a, for me at least, it was sort of a startling observation. And so either you need a lot of heat flow across the core mantle boundary to ensure convection, but if we just assume a sort of a linear extrapolation from one Earth mass to 10 Earth mass, the rise in the thermal conductivity is so high that will suppress any sort of convection that happens in the more massive planets. And so you can arrive in a picture like this, and this is probably one of the last slides that I'm gonna have is that, um, one Earth mass, you know, we have this mantle, a liquid dynamo, and then a solid core. And for somehow between four and five Earth mass, you start to have these very interesting possibilities where you get this partial melting in the silicates, a deep basal magma ocean, uh, and then a solid iron core with no liquid component. And so you don't have a sort of a liquid iron dynamo originating here. And then as you even grow from four Earth mass to 10 Earth mass, you can have a, a, a deeper liquid mantle uh, in the lower part of the mantle because of the, the melting line of MgSi3. Uh, and so also no solid, uh, solid core, no liquid core. And so the, the three main points that I want to drive here is that if we just extrapolate from one Earth mass to more massive planets, assuming Earth-like composition, 
And you can argue that, you know what, we don't have to have an Earth-like composition. And I agree, that, that's a great point. But if we do that, there's very, very different pictures of super Earth-type planets that start to emerge, which is absolutely not Earth-like in terms of its internal properties. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is that I, there's a lot of things that I've ignored in this exercise. You have, I've ignored that the mantle can be largely MGO rather than MGI3. I ignore the effects of giant impacts, which is something that's stricter than other have tried to account for the melting. Uh, turbulent convection can suppress the chemical differentiation, and so you wouldn't have a homogeneous sort of lower mantle. Uh, you can have a different distribution of radioactive elements, which gives you a very different heat source uh, this, across the core mantle boundary. You, the tidal heating can get very higher surface temperature, which might ensure a liquid sort of iron. Uh, there's also this intriguing possibility of silicate dynamos. And so there's a lot of things I have an account here. But I would like to close by uh, the closing statement of Hard Ori in his book, The Planets, Their Origin and Development. And I'm just going to read this and leave it here. The chronology of events given is a complicated, he was trying to explain how planets originate. And the chronology of events given is a very complicated one, but the true one is certainly even more complicated. And we will never be able to reconstruct the complete course of events which led to the solar system. And in this field, judgments in regard to true or false require a long period of time, but do not despair. A serious student will receive a great reward as he must have abandoned the imperfect hypotheses for a more useful one once we have better observational data. Thank you guys so much. Um, thank you so much for, for what was an incredibly thought-provoking uh, last, last hour. So I want to, before, um, before people trickle out, mention that Mohammed is going to stay and for a postdoc Q&A a little while on the same Zoom. So for people who are interested in engaging him more for questions um, in, the, in that following time period, uh, just stay here. Um, but is, is, there, is there any questions from, from the, the rest of the, the audience? I don't know if it's best to like do hand raising. Is that the best way to do this? I see Mike is squinting. I wasn't sure if that is uh, dismayed by the what I've just said. Put my glasses back on here. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it looks like Alicia Weinberger has a, has a hand uh, raised. So back to the, to the giant planet fields. So the data that I'm aware of from Melody Cow and Greg Hallinan suggests that isolated brown dwarfs with masses akin to giant planets have much larger magnetic fields than predicted by any of those um, methods. So where do you think that leaves us with the understanding of the, the magnetic fields? So uh, let's see, the last time I talked to Mildy, this was before she moved to University of Arizona, there was a lot of excitement about, as you said, these measurements for the brown dwarfs and uh, the discussion at the time was that are these planets, uh, if we get a measurement for a 15 sort of uh, Jupiter type mass, can we classify this as planets and say the same form framework does apply? And at that time, it was, clear, it's not, it was not clear. Stevenson had a strong opinion that yes, up to 12 uh, Jupiter mass, you should classify them as a planet. And so the same dynamo theory should apply. Uh, he sort of was more leaning into the energy balance framework saying that the magnetic moment, if the planet is fast rotating and convective enough, it shouldn't really matter on the internal properties. Uh, but then Melody came out with this new observation that says it's even much higher than any of the frameworks. And so I, 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 I don't know, I think it's extremely exciting. Maybe we need better frameworks for how the dynamo uh, action sort of originates. Thanks. I think I, think I see Larry has a hand raised as well. Yeah, that, that was a very interesting talk. Um, back to Jupiter for a second. I, it's really interesting that you see that the dynamo has to start so close to the surface. And if I understood you, you said that that would lead to the field being mostly higher order multipole moments. But that, but when you actually showed Jupiter's field from Juno, didn't it? It still looks mostly dipolar, doesn't it? And yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry if I didn't explain that that well. So it is mostly dipolar, and this is, I mean, it, the the surprise here for some of the observation is that the non dipolar component is actually different from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. What I meant that if it's closer to the surface, uh, the observations 
So for example, for Earth, because the field originates so much deeper into the interior, if you have some sort of remote observation, if you put a magnetic moment that returns to the Earth, you don't see a lot because crustal magnetism sort of hinders your vision. But what you see in Jupiter is because the, the, the field originates much, much, much closer to the surface. It gives you much better insight about the J12 and the J14 and all these higher order magnetic components. And so it gives us much deeper insight into the, the dynamo. Okay, so but can this can these this, these field measurements are they consistent with the dynamo starting at point yes. nine? Oh, okay, yeah. I missed that. If, okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like Faye also has his hand raised too. Hi, uh, this is a Faye, and uh, I just want to kind of gather your feeling. Uh, you know where this uh, 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 kind of research you're going because. Uh, you know, I, I have been doing some Z uh, uh, machine experiments on the uh, silicate. And uh, so the question is for the mineral physicists in uh, uh, like density and melting temperature is, is the main thing we can measure right now, relatively precisely compared to what the model needs for modeling and the super earth or giant planet. So, so come to the next question is really, you know, is, is a compositional uh, effect is going to be very small on the melding and the density. So, so questions for us to move forward, how to make an impact and where, where you see this is going, you know, it, 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 in terms of the, what's the priority for us to provide the useful data to really connecting with the, uh, a modeler and uh, astronomy. Yeah, you can always count on Faye to give you a very insightful question. Uh, that's an amazing question. Um, I think the, the, the exercise, at least in my mind, the way I approach this problem was to say, let's say that the composition is the same. We have an identical planet that grew up in a very similar sort of a stellar companion than that to our sun. And say if we get a bigger and bigger and bigger, if the radius is that much higher and the mass is that much higher, what sort of layer and structural and internal composition can sort of arrive? This is like a first order question, which is I think what our field has been doing. We're starting to learn that some of these planets emerged in a more carbon-rich atmospheres, have star companions that have more carbon-rich than oxygen-rich. And so this raises a very tantalizing possibility that the magma and the magmatic generation in some of the planets might be a carbon-rich minerals than an oxygen-bearing minerals. And so it is definitely possible that you can have some mantles of these super-Earth planets that grew up in a carbon-rich uh, environment, which will have silicon carbides not SiO2, not Mg, SiO3, and so you get the carbon replacing the oxygen. And I think as far as the melting line of these sort of carbide-based minerals, we still don't have a lot of good data. We have some data for the silicates, oxygen-bearing minerals, but we don't have a, a lot of data for the carbide. Another exercise that I've been people doing is that you sort of a deep learning, machine learning sort of approach and say, okay, we don't know what the starting composition is, but let's get all the spectroscopic data from luminosity of some uh, stellar bodies and see what that means for a starting point. And so you put all the elements that you have and everything that you observe and you see like a peak somehow, iron, oxygen, silicon, and you say, if this is the starting composition, what sort of an eventual planet can, inform, can form or emerge from this sort of a starting composition? I think that that that's a might be a promising approach because uh, going through all the data from individual planets, we're starting to see how diverse planet architectures are and how diverse the the starting elemental composition is, and we really don't have an intuition to say we can have a model mm -hmm. for every solar body, stellar type body. Good. I don't know if this answers your question. <laughs> it looks like Mike has his hand raised as well. Maybe I'll just make this the last question, and um, I'll just r remind everyone that we're in, uh, that we're meeting at two o'clock again in the Carnegie Worlds or Carnegie Planets group, and we can interrogate uh, Muhammad a bit more on, on some of these issues. Then um, I had one quick question about the plot you showed for this going back to Jupiter's. Um, it was the radius of the depth of the dynamo versus planetary radius as a function of mass. Yeah, that one. And why, so why is there such a wide range of 
of radius where you can have a dynamo around one Jupiter mass? Oh, okay. Uh, that, 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 that's a good question. So um, uh, the individual blue triangle, these are actual planets that we know it's, uh, it's RP and we know it's mass. And so one of the things that we're learning from the, from the census data of this, just the spectroscopic observation is that we're, we, we sort of saw, we sort of expected most of Jupiter mass type planets to have one Jupiter radius. But what we're seeing is that there's a lot of planets because either the way they emerge closer to their star companions, or maybe they migrated from the original position to another position, you get some planets that are, have points, uh, almost 0.4 or 0.5 Jupiter mass, but they have one Jupiter mass. And if you talk to planetary formation theory people, we really don't know why that happens. Okay, yeah, I understand that now, thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll see you at two. I guess the postdocs are gonna stay on and uh, ask you a few questions. Maybe you can have a chance to take a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking for 70 minutes straight. Um, thank you so and, much. Um, thanks so much for a great talk. And uh, we'll, we'll see you again later. Okay, thank you. <laughs>